This video explains event objects, which are designed specifically to orchestrate IT operations and various external events taking place in the greater IT space. These events range from database events, to events occurring on the systems where agents are installed, to file systems, and more. The event object is cyclical in nature. For each of these event types, we provide an event object template out of the box. When you create your first event object, you will notice many different template types. Event objects are executable and, as such, make it possible to synchronize the rest of operations with external events. The way we do this is the same as any other executable object, by incorporating event objects in workflows and by incorporating script code. Scripting can be added in two places, first in the conventional process page. This code executes when the event object executes. But the event also has a dedicated event process page, which executes specifically when the supervised external event occurs and is detected by the object, which is then triggered. Here, we provide a quick outline of the various event types that Atomic Automation is able to watch for. The first is the console. On each system, we find an agent which sends console messages back to the engine server each time an event occurs like a failed job or a non-responsive agent. The console objects can parse through these messages and triggers when specific text strings are found. The database event is able to compare two database records based on queries or set values. The object triggers based on the results of that comparison, if they match or if they're different. The file event supervises file and file system events and will be the subject of a demonstration in the video. The time event is the easiest. It triggers based on dates and times. It is also the subject of a demo. Finally, we have analytics events to monitor the contents of a number of things, such as web service queries. Since the time event is the easiest to explain, we use it to show how these objects are designed and how script is used. Time-based events are simple. The object does not monitor anything. Instead, it simply triggers when the system's clock matches one of the properties defined in frequency, intervals, first trigger, time range, and calendar. Note, because this is important, that all of these properties are also found in every other event type. As stated earlier, the time event object does not monitor anything. It just executes based on time, which can also be defined in all other templates. In order to create our first event, we open the process assembly perspective, which is the environment in which configuration design takes place. We create a folder dedicated to the object type, create the object, and give it a title, which is a description, something we recommend because it's helpful for object searches. This is the time event page. The first property is the frequency. This determines how often objects trigger, executing any associated process. The once setting means that once executed, the object takes the sleeping status and triggers when it reaches the time specified below in the activate property. It can be immediately, based on a delay in minutes, or a set time. Let's change this to repeatedly and set the trigger to a cycle in minutes. This tells us that on the date stipulated by the properties found below under time and date conditions, the object will trigger every three minutes. As soon as we execute the object, it does not trigger immediately. Instead, it does so after the first three minutes have expired. Under time and date conditions, we find two settings. The first is defined by the from and to fields. If we set from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., then the object would trigger every three minutes between those times. If we add a calendar event, say every Saturday, then the object would trigger on Saturdays only. If we leave everything blank, then the object triggers every day around the clock.
In the process page, we can add code. This code executes immediately, as soon as the object is executed, but not triggered. The distinction's important. Say our time event had a calendar event that designated the first of the year. Then the object would trigger on January 1st only. The code added here would be irrelevant. However, if we execute the object by clicking on the Execute button, then this code executes right away. We add an Activate UC Object Base command. When the object is executed, it will execute the Unix job in parentheses. It is in the Event Process page that we add the code we want to run when the object triggers, in other words, when the time requirements match the system clock. If we had the first of the month calendar events we mentioned earlier, then the object would trigger on 1st of January, and this code would execute. To illustrate the difference between the two process pages, this time we execute a Windows job. We save the object and open the process monitoring perspective before we execute. This is entirely consistent with our explanation. The time event object is executed and the code contained in the process page, the Unix job, is executed immediately. We wait three minutes, which is the first interval and time we have to wait until first trigger. We use the refresh button. Eventually the Unix job completes and deactivates. Three minutes later, the event triggers once and returns to its sleeping status immediately. The code of the event process page, the Windows job, executes. The file event has all the time parameters offered by the time object, but it also allows us to supervise file and file system events. We can synchronize operations with files and directories, files created, the available space in a file system, and more. We create a new object, this time a file event. Here we find properties in line with the file watcher type mechanisms. We specify a path to either a file system or file and check conditions. In this case, the condition we check is the number of files in a directory. This can be useful for situations where files are being moved here via FTP. If we reach a critical number of files, the object triggers. We use the same trigger as before. It's a simple Windows job in the event process page. Note that behind the scenes, we have already created seven dummy files in ctemp, which is the directory we're using. So let's consider this code statement. This time we set a variable using the getFileSystem function. Consider the arguments. First the agent, win01, then the directory, ctemp, then another function, pathFileCounts. Then we echo the variable to the activation reports with the print command. This is important when you're working with event objects. You can either use the GUI tools, which we did earlier, when we set the directory and matching conditions. But you can also use functions such as getFileSystem, which are dedicated to event objects. This function analyzes a file system using the arguments we specified, agent, directory, and file counts. The use of this function means we didn't need to consider the GUI portion of the objects. We simply set a variable ampersand filenumhash to the number of files in ctemp 
on the system where the Win01 agent is installed. Then we could use code logic to trigger any behavior based on the value of this variable. Here, we're merely printing it to the activation reports. The GUI part will do the actual supervising. Remember that this time we're supervising a file system on an agent. Therefore, we need to specify the agent and log in in the attributes page. The code from the event process page, which counts the number of files in ctemp, executes as well and returns the value 7 through the print command. This is because the matching condition, number of files in ctemp greater than 5, was met immediately with the existing 7 files in ctemp.